We have two distinguished guests, Professor Bruno Verhoeven, who is uh, the president-elect of our SR. So uh, we, we're familiar, and not everybody knows this, but uh, Ludo was one of the uh, people uh, present at the opening of the Safra Center when Lily Safra was here with her entourage. Yeah, so he's, uh, he was right there, right from the beginning. He's been part of uh, associate, has an association with the Safra Center. Professor Elian Zegers, I'll introduce after uh, Ludo speaks. Uh, <coughs> Ludo, I think everyone in the literacy area knows well and uh, you know he's just a fan uh, he's a wonderful guy and he's been a friend of ours and the Safra Center for very long his background is in linguistics and psychology and education which is wonderful combination I think that's uh, part of the secret of his success and uh, we will uh, without further ado we'll hear about development of dyslexia in Dutch Okay, thank you, thank you, David, for your nice opening words. Uh, it's very special to come back to Haifa, indeed, uh, after the opening of the Software Center, and I was also asked to give one of those uh, uh, Diana uh, uh, Feitelson lectures, uh, lectures yeah. which was very special to be here. Uh, and also, it, it shows that uh, what I would always like to do is to do focus on fundamental research on the one hand, and also think through. Uh, possibilities for practice for teachers uh, on the other hand. Um, the topic for today is uh, developmental dyslexia in Dutch and uh, you could sit, uh, think well why is it interesting in another language and, and uh, it can be boring also but I think it's uh, it can be interesting because it's uh, as you know an alphabetic language and, and we know a lot about uh, uh, English orthography uh, uh, David has mentioned this many times, so the kind of bias towards that. And Dutch uh, can be considered uh, a transparent orthography. So uh, within four months of reading instruction, formal reading instruction in first grade, children learn the graphemes and learn to glue them together into words. So a partial word decoding being built up. And after <coughs> four months, they can do word decoding. Full word decoding, and they know all the letters. And by the end of uh, first grade, they are already fairly uh, automatic in word decoding. And that's one point. And the other point is that doing over the grades, then uh, growing word decoding is not a matter of uh, growing uh, accuracy because children are fully accurate. It's a matter of growing speed. So then the question is for today, uh, what will be the result for dyslexic uh, children? Will they also be accurate from the very beginning, transparent orthography, or will they have also accuracy problems on top of efficiency problems, which have to <coughs> uh, deal with speed. And the other question is, um, how about precursors? We know about all those precursor measures like uh, phonological awareness, rapid naming, uh, phonological working memory. Do they play a role in this lecture in the transparent orthography or not? Or is it just a matter of uh, decoding? And also, if we talk about decoding, as you know, I will go back to this all. But they give you a kind of summary to start with. Word decoding and pseudo word decoding makes a difference. For pseudo word decoding, children see the words for the first time, so that's a kind of uh, big effort to really decode the words that go to the underlying phonological representation. And if you have seen words many, quite often, so not in pseudo word decoding, but word decoding, then it is easier to do the job because you have seen the word already, you have done the job of word decoding before, and there is a representation already in your memory, and it's just a matter of lexical access of that orthographic representation. So the question is for dyslexics, will it be a matter of word decoding problems or uh, pseudo word uh, uh, decoding problems? Uh, what will do uh, precursor measures play a role? And also, if it's if we can say in a phonologically regular orthography, it, phonology may be a problem also. So it can be phonology itself, or is it the conversion of graphemes and phonemes? So can we, if we look at the phonological capacity of children, do we find in dyslexic children or children at risk 
already phonological pro uh, problems before they start learning to read. So that's a kind of uh, summary for, for today. So the question that I uh, will um, go through is, first I will take a kind of neurocognitive perspective. So we are, I think, uh, um, well, I think like a year lab, um, half of the work uh, focuses on the brain, the other half is more behavioral studies. So it's a mixture in our case as well. So how does the brain learn to read? How can the growth of Dutch vertical be modeled? So I'll think through again that is highly transparent. Um, how do reading problems become manifest? Which neurocognitive factors underlying uh, its reading problems? And the line of practice, how is this actually defined and assessed? And finally, <coughs> is there evidence of successful intervention? Uh, the final thing is also interesting for, from a theoretical point of view, because if uh, reading problems in a, a transparent orthography are highly a matter of uh, deficiency in, in reading speed, then the question is, from a theoretical point of view, can we uh, think of an intervention that will increase reading speed? And that's, I think that's very new, and we, we, we just completed the meta-analysis on uh, dyslexia intervention, and by far, it's 80-90% of the work has been done on accuracy. So, and our question was, can we also improve reading problems if those problems are a matter of slow speed? So, null basis of language development to start with, because we know that uh, learning to read builds on one language, the so language faculties in the, in the brain, um, representation, uh, so there's a place in, in, in the brain where words are being stored in memory with all the word specific characteristics, the phonological representation, semantic representation, morphology, it's all there. There is unification, the grammar, which can glue words together so that we can uh, integrate words into sentences, sentences into text. And there is a control uh, part in the brain, working memory to keep words in your memory temporarily, and also you can suppress, inhibit, and update information. Also, attention also is part of it. So, the, the, the <coughs> yellow part is the mental lexicon, the other grammar part is more fondly, it's the control part, and if it comes to language development, then we see that the children from birth to uh, three years old, that they learn to identify word boundaries, discriminate for names, search patterns, International boundaries and lexical processes comes in after 12 months, and then after two years, sentence processing is being started. So this is a kind of developmental pathway that children go through, and we can track those <coughs> processes also not only in behavioral research, but especially interesting <coughs> with this young child to do that <coughs> with uh, brain measures because children cannot um, uh, respond in behavioral tasks that we can track uh, problems uh, already in the early years with MMS, CPS, and 400, P600 measures <coughs> with ERPs. And, and a clear example, an interesting one, is that uh, after 12 years old, then uh, the uh, idea of phoneme boundaries in terms of categorical perception comes in. And so the idea is that if you do an alcohol task in, in which you can have the same bar uh, being repeated, and then at a certain moment in time, once in a while you present a doubt to the children, then the brain will react on that. And that's different from the control measure, so you can see that with the MNN, with the mismatch negative. Thing. But the interesting thing is that if children are below age of 12 months, then they uh, have no clear cut distinction between the bar and the dot, but in between they can hear sounds as well. So in between, there's the with formal transi transitions uh, in, in, the, uh, 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 in, in the vowel, it's uh, uh, part of the bar, the compositions. And there was seven steps to be taken from bar to da, and those young babies, they hear the differences in between. And by age 12, uh, month, it's gone. So what we see here is that you see this is the control measure, which is the same 
negative that pops up. That's control here. This is the da, and by 10, this is 10 months of age, we see that the brain is also reacting to a stimulus in which there is a kind of within position. And two months later, and children have lost it within uh, uh, position, so they don't, don't hear this anymore, and then it's a full categorical perception between the bar and da. But interestingly, one of the hypotheses is that dyslexic children uh, have problems in making this contest, and that they on and on, they still may hear those within uh, boundaries. So that their phoneme boundaries are not that clear cut as in the typical children, and that is one of our hypotheses later on in our research. So then when it comes to electrical <coughs> processing in the oral mode, so it's just a matter of via the context, storybook reading and all those kind of activities. Children learn new words by making connections between phonological notes on the one hand and semantic notes on the other hand. And then we see that the development of the Dutch mental lexicon goes from uh, 2,000 representations in the first year of kindergarten and then step by step they go up to 15,000 words by the end of primary school. So this is uh, like uh, 1,500 words set a year that they learn per year and that's uh, on average five words a day. So that's, uh, that's what the, the teacher has to accomplish to have uh, children uh, being taught uh, five words a day. And you see here an interesting uh, 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 change in the, in the, uh, uh, the curve from at grade two. And you have any idea why, why this can, how this can be applied? This is not going read. on like this. We yeah, so have a lot of reading. Yeah, so we need to read. Yeah, sure. So therefore, the, all the vocabulary will uh, change substantially. So when it comes to learning to read, we have a, an extra note to be accomplished. So uh, a note between letter, or a combination between letter notes and phonological notes. So this is what children have to learn. As I said, children in, in Holland with the Dutch language, get, uh, uh, transparent orthography, it's not a big deal. They can do that in four months. And then they make the connection between letters and sounds. And then they have orthographic representation. And it's important that they build up those representations always this way, that they start out from orthographic representation, that they uh, find the underlying <coughs> philosophical representation and then go to the meaning. So if you are dyslexic, you, this is not possible to do this. And you have to make a connection from the orthographic representation directly to the meaning. And that means that you have to learn all the orthographic representations by heart. So in the reading brain, we all know that there is a kind of area in which uh, the letter sound uh, combina combinations uh, are being uh, produced. So the visual word form area, integration of letter sound correspondences, a lot of evidence from, from different studies that all point to the same direction. And now we see that in the brain, not only is there a mental lexicon, a grammar, and a control system, but also a letter of sound, correspondency, uh, a kind of uh, a mental letter box, which, when it is connected to the, the, the original oral uh, language network, makes it possible to, to, <coughs> to not only to word encoding, but also the reading comprehension, because the whole system then also the, does the language uh, thing. You see uh, the different uh, parts of the brain involved in spoken word uh, 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 recognition and uh, written word recognition. And we see that the, the extra part is this part, the red part and the formal one. Here we see the, the oral language parts, and this is the uh, mental letter, letter box. So facts about learning to read. One is, as you all know from your master here on the table, um, that it's about self-teaching, so successful uh, decoding leads to orthographic learning, and it's an item-based lexicalization process, so for every word, you have, children have to learn the underlying phonological representation for uh, uh, orthographic representations. We all know from the work by uh, uh, Charles Buffetti and others, well, but he has um, mentioned the interactive lexical model in which he states, he maintains that for in this self-teaching process afterwards uh, uh, being uh, decoded, 
then it's a matter of uh, being more precise and more redundant in the representation of those autograph representations. So by reading more and more, uh, children will become better and that uh, they will become, the representation will become more precise and also more automatic. So the strength of the representations will also uh, become better. And then finally, there is uh, uh, neurobiological evidence that when it comes to word reading, uh, two roots can be distinguished. One is a phonology based root, more indirect root, so that's the typical word decoding that you see the word for the first time. It's an indirect root, and that's a, a, a dorsal root in which the connection between orthography and phonology plays an important role. And if uh, words have been seen more often, then they become automatized and then also it's true that there will be another root in the brain, the ventral root, which is more semantic based. So we know uh, that this is the indirect uh, root, so going with the pseudo words, words being seen for the first time, you have to do it via uh, graphene phoneme correspondency rules, make you have seen words more often, or if you have irregular words, that doesn't fit with the graphene or neat paradigm, then you can have a direct root. Here it is a matter of assembling phonology of those autographic representations. And here you have already assembled the uh, phonological representation, so it's already there in your, in your memory, and then if you see the word then again, then it's just a matter of textual access. Well, uh, People like uh, Stanislaw de Haan have has made uh, nice overviews from the current state of the art of brain research and as I said, there's uh, two roots. So when the visual word form comes in, then first uh, there is this dorsal root in which words have to be learned uh, to, to be signed without. So that means that the, audio, the phonological representation has to be uh, learned, has to be acquired and then it uh, finds a place in the brain and uh, if th this uh, code has been made and the angular gyrus in the brain is an important uh, aspect in that then words can be recognized with this green wood, wood, uh, green wood and uh, I would say the green line <laughs> <laughs> and um, that means that uh, um, uh, that's a matter of flexible access and that's the temporal root okay then we talk about uh, the, the transparent orthography of Dutch, so as I said before, in terms of orthographic depth, it's uh, almost the same as uh, Finnish, uh, so it's uh, highly transparent. Um, the graphene for the correspondence is there is for CVC words, for very short words, constant power, constant words, it's almost one to one correspondence. For consonant clauses, it's more or less the same, so you can have words. With, uh, with three consonants and uh, four consonants at the end, so STR and KSP, ST, strict. You have those words in, in, in Dutch, which is more complicated than the simple CPC. And you have, of course, uh, uh, polysyllabic words, and pre final stress can make some uh, autographic difficulties. But those are quite minimal. Well, this is uh, the phoneme inventory. The, the, uh, graphene for names for the vowels, but those are all quite regular. And there's some minor orthographic problems, like in poly polysyllabic words, you can have the letter E can have different pronunciations. So this is the word uh, recognition, which means to take apart. So the E is uh, the S sound, the A, A sound, and the U sound, with one and the same graphene. And there is some multi-letter graphemes, uh, the word screw here, so at the end of a, of a vowel and the W, there's a U in between, a special thing, and there is some uh, complexity in morphological analogies, like the uh, singular form of house, means house, goes, the S goes to a Z in the plural, because that's the way I pronounce it, so it's, you say house, and huizen, so that goes from S to a Z, and here it's the other way around, hunt. You hear a, a, a T sound, but it is a D because the plural has uh, hunt done as a D sound, and therefore 
this is a kind of analogy. And um, like a tea with um, high loft, so the tea is walking, um, or doesn't come when there is already a tea at the verb uh, root ending. So these are minor things. So for the rest, it's uh, quite. Uh, um, yeah, so I can I can pass this one. So when it comes to uh, learning to read Dutch, um, we did several studies. One is that we uh, wanted to know uh, because of early literacy, and we did study with quite a number of uh, children in kindergarten. Uh, we took uh, early literacy measures, letter knowledge, um, letter spelling, word spelling. There spelling. was some exposure to written language in kindergarten play format, but still children pick up letters and sounds, and we were interested in, uh, in how the emergence of literacy could be predicted from their phonological capacity in terms of phonological coding, uh, uh, so phoneme discrimination, phonological me working memory, etc., phonological awareness, the awareness of all kinds of sounds and rapid naming of uh, words uh, in this case. Um, this published as just published in Reading and Writing this year in 2016. What we did was we took <coughs> quite a few measures, so uh, a bunch of measures on uh, phonological coding, a bunch of measures on phonological awareness, you uh, may know all those kind of tasks with learning from the segmentation and the modulation, so, and also uh, a number of uh, two naming speed um, tasks, and this was to, uh, be more valid in uh, tapping the constructs of phonological coding, phonological lines and naming speed. So not only one measure, but several measures and with factor analysis, we could indeed uh, uh, show that there were three factors involved. And with those factor scores, we tried to figure out what the relationship was over time between uh, phonological <coughs> measures on the one hand and literacy measures, emergent literacy measures on the other hand. Here we see the development of Phonological coding, so there's a, a strong longitudinal effect of 0.92. Also for phonological awareness, this is the beginning of kindergarten, this is of the end of kindergarten, and we see that also by the end of kindergarten that uh, um, the children's <coughs> letter knowledge and word decoding and letter spelling and word spelling is highly influenced by phonological awareness. And if you take already phonological awareness into account, there is no influx direct influx anymore for phonological coding. So all the phonological measures, they are being uh, mediated through phonological awareness. So they play a role, but they have an effect already at the beginning of kindergarten. So the phonological coding capacity predicts the phonological awareness. And if we take this through, there's no additional uh, uh, influx from phonological coding measures to uh, uh, phonological awareness and to emergent literacy. So our conclusion is that the emergence of literacy uh, comes from phonological awareness and this uh, on its turn is predicted from phonological coding at the very beginning. There's also a, a role of uh, naming speed, so <coughs> it's the same model and we see what naming speed is adding to this and we find an interesting impact of uh, naming speed on children's level knowledge. And this was a speed of measure, so this is why you this can be done. <coughs> the conclusion here, phonological coding is conditional for phonemic awareness. Phonemic awareness predicts better knowledge of ready coding, and naming speed predicts phonological coding and better knowledge. So then, the development of uh, word decoding, as I said before, children in first grade are being taught the graphemes in four months of time, so by, in sets of uh, four. Uh, words and what we did here is this is the children's word decoding after three weeks. So they got a set of six graphemes and then another set of six graphemes, another set of six graphemes. And each time with those um, graphemes being taught, we took a word decoding measure. So it's kind of incremental word decoding during phonics instruction. So this is the first four months of instruction. And interestingly, we see an enormous predictability of already the first moment with the six graphemes. That's already predictive, highly predictive. This is a standard measure after halfway 
uh, first grade, but you see how influential the first um, result on the exposure in, in first grade is already with the six square figures. And it's not only here, but it's going from one moment to the other. So the effort is substantial. And then the second interesting point is that you can see here that uh, phonemic awareness is again, so this is uh, the first graders, this is kindergarten, so the uh, kindergarten's uh, phonemic awareness is predicting uh, children's uh, uh, word decoding, and uh, rapid naming adds to that, and there's also a little influx from uh, visual sort of memory, and later on, see the word rate recognition, when it becomes more tough, more graphemes being involved, and also uh, uh, phones go work, work in memory plays a role. When it comes to the development of uh, decoding efficiency, we find out that, um, um, uh, I should say first, this is moment of measurement, so this is 10 months of instruction, that means by the end of first grade, we have second grade, so this is the end of sixth grade, so each grade we took two moments of word decoding efficiency. Word decoding accuracy was full accuracy. So already halfway, uh, 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 the end of first grade was full accuracy alone. Uh, the, the sexy will come later, but for the, uh, the typical children, they are highly accurate from the very beginning, yeah. How do you measure decoding efficiency? What's the measure? Yeah, that's the number of words being read in one minute. In one minute, yeah. correct. So yeah, correct. Correct. Yeah. correct. Yeah, yeah, so there's little influx yeah. on. On, on, on accuracy, but that, that's yes. more that they right. sometimes make mistakes. <coughs> and what we see here is that uh, the development of vertical efficiency, the number of words being read in one minute, so you can see this goes up to 120. This is the CBC patterns. The second one, the second line is the, uh, the words with consonant clusters, and these are the polysyllabic words. Uh, interestingly, we see that there is a significant increase from one moment to the other on all those different word patterns. So uh, if we uh, take word length into account, then even in sixth grade, children make significant progress in word decoding efficiency. So, uh, and I think this is one of the very few uh, longitudinal studies uh, that have been done over all grades, and therefore it's highly informative that this is going on. I, I spoke with a colleague of, uh, from Spain, a uh, distinguished researcher, and and she was thinking that, that by, by grade three, this is not, not growing anymore. So it's, it's finished because they are accurate and they, and they can do the work. But we see here in this thing. So it's only focused important. on accuracy. Excuse me? Forget fluency. Well, I mean, yeah, sure. Yeah, so if you see the, uh, the effects uh, then the, in terms of the, the Cohen's D, then we see that going from first moment to second moment, second to third, so all those steps halfway uh, the grades, that this, the critical uh, significance level of 0.2 with the uh, current D is, is there. So that's an important result here. And we also thought, well, maybe uh, if you think through a kind of unidimensional model of all those word times, different word lengths, so maybe there is some underlying measure of decoding that explains the three word patterns, and and so we try to model this, but did, did, didn't come out. This didn't come out. So what we found was uh, also some unique variance was in those three measures. So that means we found an underlying uh, capacity of, of decoding, which was uh, highly substantial and also highly stable over time. But there was some unique variance on the three word types. And we see that here, it's a kind of complex configuration. But here you see the longitudinal uh, uh, growth of word decoding, predicting from word decoding one moment to the second, etc. So you see that there's highly high stability of word decoding over time with those growing words. And there is some univariance with in the very beginning goes to the letters being taught in the beginning. Later on, the constant clusters are being taught, so that the unit variance comes in a little bit later, and the polysyllabic words come a little bit later also. So it's a kind of mechanism in which the, there's high, uh, highly uniform word decoding, but there's also some unit variance for those different orthographic patterns.
So the conclusions here, strong developmental growth through a primary school, speech much stronger determined and accuracy, quadratic growth models, so that's what growth models, leveling off. <coughs> so there's just a curves, and it's interesting also that Logistic curves are typical in, in all kinds of learning processes. The children start out slow, you play tennis, and then you, through practice you make enormous growth, and then it's leveling off, and you want to become uh, a very proficient player. Um, high correlations for subscale, but also unit pregnancies. Okay, now we come to the, to the heart of the topic, problems in learning to read. So the question is, uh, how do those lexic uh, children do with those tasks. So the first question is here was, uh, is decoding accuracy and speed uh, different? And is it also uh, uh, word length? Does that play a role? We know from, from Italian research that word length plays a significant role in, in word decoding, um, which I mentioned unlike functional recoding in lower, medium, and upper grades. And to what extent do the section children differ from the typically reading peers in when going in percussion? So we took <coughs> again a long uh, longitudinal study with a substantial group of uh, children. Um, we made a new reading and line tests, and now we not only had uh, meaningful words, but also pseudo words. And we not only had polysyllabic, but also bisyllabic, so we had CBC patterns, one measure. We computed the number of words being read per minute for all those words. Uh, consonant clusters, bisyllabic words, polysyllabic words, also versions of pseudo words. So this would be an indicator of the typically uh, first step in word decoding, because still I've never seen those words. And the word, meaningful words, that's the possibility of lexicalization, so lexical access taking place. We took the follicle precursor measures that we found earlier that are relevant. On the repetition of the lines, word span and right again. And we did regression analysis also to uh, find out about the functional precursors. So here we see the development of uh, word decoding uh, accuracy, first of all with uh, the typical children, with these new measures. So we see that uh, 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 children become uh, fairly accurate by, by the end of uh, first grade on all the simple measures. and like in second grade, second, third grade, that become fully accurate. Uh, for pseudo word decoding, it's a little bit different because it's harder. These are the words that uh, need to be decoded for the first time. So we see that, that those are not fully accurate, which is interesting. And the development of word decoding efficiency were, were in line with the uh, uh, previous study that I presented just before for meaningful words. And it's leveling well up a little bit, but also significant growth from one motion, moment to the other on uh, pseudo word decoding, which means that the word decoding act in itself with pseudo words is also growing. So it's not only a ma ma matter of um, uh, having lexical representations being formed in your brain, but also that the act of doing uh, uh, word decoding with new words is also growing. As a capacity. So here we see the leveling off of the uh, pseudo words in comparison with the, with the meaningful words. So we found uh, the meaning versus pseudo word was in effect, word length was in effect, measurement, all those interactions, uh, terrific effect. So that means that those uh, measures are all relevant if you want to study development of word recording. Precursors of phonological recording in first grade. We, in the very beginning, we found that uh, uh, not only phonological awareness, rapid naming, but also the other measures uh, play the role in word decoding, and the same in pseudo word decoding. Later on, in uh, grade four, we see that rapid naming has become now the dominant uh, predictor, and there's a little bit of influx also from phonological awareness, and this is also found for um, the pseudo words. Okay, then um, if we take into account the level of word decoding at first grade and we look at the final measure of word decoding at fourth grade, then we see that rapid naming is the only measure uh, that's, that's still predicting uh, the progress that children make 
in uh, um, vertical coding, and this is also true for pseudo vertical coding. So high stability, so the auto regressing, regression is uh, high, but we find an extra influx of German serpentine. Well, for dyslexia, we want to see if there are any decoding effects. So focus on accuracy versus efficiency measures, pseudo word decoding versus word decoding, interaction with word length, and we wanted to see if there was an additional uh, uh, precursor effect. So is the difference between dyslexic and typical children in Dutch in transparent photography only a matter of uh, problems with uh, initial word decoding? So is that, is that the critical problem for making the conversion, the digital letterbox, or is there also in the phonological uh, aspects, the, the broker area, or maybe also the Renica area, in the uh, autographic and semantic areas in the brain, are there also additional precursor efforts? Here we see uh, the differences between dyslexic children, uh, which are, uh, are the, the dark ones, on the four measures. So this is for accuracy on word decoding, CVC measures, this one, and you see the typical children, they become fairly accurate from the very beginning and uh, are fully accurate halfway primary school, also on the, the Polish syllabic, that means, that means uh, more than two syllables. Uh, but we see that the dyslexics are not accurate. So there still are problems in gaining accuracy. And if it comes to uh, pseudo words, we see that there's a discrepancy that there's an interaction effect here that the problems are much higher in uh, word decoding, in the initial forming of words, than as compared to the, um, the, real, the real word uh, uh, decoding. Which means that the problem is really at the, at, at the, the, ch at the children, children word decoding, in the initial forming of decoding of those words. Um, here we see. Um, well, it's the same thing, so, but here is the thing. Uh, uh, what we did here was, this is the, the distribution of the uh, dyslexic students on word decoding here and on pseudo word decoding for the different word patterns as compared to the Z distribution of all children. So we see that the dyslexics are below standard deviation on pseudo words on all cases. And for words, they have some overlap with the typical children. But this demonstrates that the heart of the problem is really on those initial word decodings and that by being trained in schools by just doing uh, repetition of words through reading, by the act of reading itself, they can compensate and uh, relatively spoken to the typical readers they make an advancement. Here we see the precursor measures. The, the, these are the dyslexic students that come in later and discovered by the end of grade three. And we follow those kids and we see that there's some the significant difference in rapid naming, but not a big deal. So they can fairly do it, the, those uh, word um, uh, rapid naming in a serial order. So there is some, some difference in phonological awareness. Uh, in sound manipulation, uh, they are a little bit behind, but they do fairly well. And in phoneme segmentation, they almost have similar levels. The differences are also here significant, but not major. So we see some influx on, on the logical measures. And if we do a discriminant analysis between the normals, the typicals, and the dyslexic children, then we see that by far the most important predictor is in the pseudo word decoding. There's some extra prediction on top of that from word decoding capacity. And the precursors play a minor role. There's some role of uh, phonological awareness in terms of sound manipulation and a minor role uh, on representing. So the conclusions here, there's growth in phonological recording fluency as a function of word length and word meaning. So this is kind of proxy of assembly plus addressing phonology. Especially problems with the assembling phonology, not so much with, with the addressing phonology. As soon as they have built up the representation, they can have access to it. There's growing dissociation between word decoding and pseudo-word fluency across the grades. 
Non with repetition, it's not global and it's rapid naming and with span predict with them to the word we influence it and rapid naming only predicts to the word we influence in development. So then neurocognitive evidence. Okay. Um, we found uh, this is a study of uh, uh, another group in Holland in, which is on Dutch and what they showed was that they uh, gave processing tasks which uh, have to deal with uh, uh, letters, which feed sounds, so that's a kind of unimodal task, and they had tasks in which ch children had to make a combination <coughs> between uh, visual and auditory uh, stimuli. And what they found was that there is, between uh, fluent and dyslexic readers, there's especially a difference in those overlap cognition. So the integration of speech and, and, uh, and letters so that's, and make that into a process, so that's the national working code. That was really something that the typical readers show, both in left and right hemisphere, and that was more minor, especially on the left side, in the dyslexic children. So they published that as a result, as a critical result. We also um, did um, an at a uh, student, Mark uh, Nordenbos, and we published several studies in which we did uh, mismatch negativity uh, on children uh, um, at risk for dyslexia uh, and controls. And um, so this is the first study. So the idea was if uh, uh, children have a, a phonological problem, um, then the question is, as I showed you in the very beginning with those babies, that maybe they can have um, underspecified phonological representation because they have no clear phoneme boundaries. That's one hypothesis. But the other hypothesis, that's the matter of phonological awareness, is that they have problems in segmenting those patterns. But one is instable uh, um, phonological representations, so that means um, uh, overspecified, so like those babies, if you have all those in between categories, then your phonological representations overspecified and therefore it's harder to make an autographic representation because that uh, requires categorical perception of, or e, of either BOD, etc. But it could also matter of underspecification that children have problems with, for example, rhyming dots. In the first study, we did a, a <coughs> rhyming judgment uh, with dys dyslexic children and um, controls. and. Um, here you see the results for the controls. The controls could um, distinguish between rhyming tasks, the, the brains could distinguish between rhyming tasks and unrelated items, so words that rhyme and do not rhyme. This is a kind of overlap condition, it's kind of in between. So if you have, for example, mess and miss, those words do not rhyme, but they have phonological overlap. And uh, we found that uh, the typical children could easily distinguish between those overlap items and the rhyming items, and uh, of course there was, and there was no distinction between overlap and unrelated. However, the dyslexic children had problems distinguishing the rhyme versus the overlap. So this is a kind of uh, indication that there may be something like um, underspecification that there are problems in segmenting out those uh, patterns. And you see uh, the same. But here is the controls, they make a clear boundary between rhyming items on the one hand and a little bit of overlap problems. But this is not, not this is not significant, so they have a clear boundary between rhyming and non-rhyming words. But the dyslexic, the in between category, they find it hard to the same. Their brains find it hard. So and if we um, then uh, think about the other <coughs> hypothesis, I give you back the same thing that I showed you in the beginning. So those babies, they may, uh, they uh, had problems distinguishing between uh, sounds uh, of uh, uh, clear categories like ba and da, and the question was here: Will those dyslexic children maybe still have those within the categories in their brains, and therefore uh, that may lead to uh, unclear phoneme boundaries, unclear letter install installations and also vertical. 
Um, so, uh, to show you, I don't know if it's working here. This is uh, how, with format transitions, Buck. you can go from Bach to Duck, and you can say why you hear the difference. And when, when, it, when you hear B and when you hear a D. Buck. 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 Okay. When do you hear the difference? Six. six. Yeah. <laughs> well, five, six, around that. Five, yeah. Sorry. yeah, yeah. So what we did, so we, we developed a, a task in which we uh, made pairs like one and three, two and four, three and five, four and six, and then to see if, where, where the boundary was. And it was not exactly the same as here, I think it was the other way around, from dark to bar. So mm -hmm. in, in, here was uh, the, the critical difference in our experiment. So this is the way we developed the stimuli, so it's on the one hand the second formant of the pulse and on the other hand the third formant and then that makes that you have those seven or eight critical steps in going from bar to da and that you can manipulate those sounds to create those uh, tasks. And uh, you will see the results. Uh, this is for uh, identification and this is for discrimination. We found no differences in um, uh, identification uh, only here at the ending and that means that the, uh, the control children were better in uh, identifying uh, those uh, upper uh, dust than as compared to the, uh, the sexy children. But here there was a, a, a nice difference or interesting difference in that at the critical point between two and four the uh, controlled children were, could easily hear the difference, while the uh, dissection children could not. And at the uncritical boundary here, at five and seven, the dissection children uh, had uh, an idea yeah, the other way around. So they thought that's, that's critical, while it was not, and the, uh, the controls didn't show the same effect. Um, so here is the same effect, but now we also controlled the at-risk group uh, in their phonological awareness capacity. So the at-risk group, if we sorted them out, also having an indication of their phonological capacity, then we see that the, um, uh, the discrimination is really uh, deviant in the, the at-risk children that are also have phonological problems. So maybe there is something at hand there. So over-specification of their representation. So then the other question was, would uh, dyslexic adults also show the same results? And so we did another study with the same kind of paradigm, making a distinction between all those things. And indeed, we also in dyslexic adults, we find in terms of identification that the dyslexic had uh, more problems in identifying the bar versus the da on, on both sides of the cell. And we also found that in terms of discrimination, there were some, at the critical points, some differences between the two groups. So, um, and we can also see that if we take the between boundaries on the one hand, so that means um, the sounds that uh, shouldn't be, uh, um, sorry, the between boundaries are between the bar and the da, so the, the, the critical uh, boundaries with both the controls and the, contro and the dyslexic adults could hear that, but the within category was not relevant for the for the brains of the adult uh, typicals, but there was still evidence for that in the uh, dyslexic adults. So conclusions here: the dyslexic showed reduced sensitivity to phonological information necessary to extract large of units. Presence of allophonic speech perception at risk of and dyslexic adults, and this may lead to unstable phoneme representation resulting from problems even in adults. So, to, to summarize so far that we, we found specific problems in uh, pseudo-word decoding, which uh, leads to the idea of seeing words for the first time, have, really have the problems in making the conversion for those autographic patterns, and there's some evidence that this may go back to uh, uh, 
On the one hand, some problems with segmentation, maybe it's individual variation also. And on the other hand, also to uh, unclear funding boundaries. Well, almost at the end, identification of uh, dyslexia. Well, in Holland, uh, thanks to the research that we and other labs have done, uh, we made a clear cut case to our uh, Ministry of Health that uh, it should be uh, focused on and that children should be uh, uh, diagnosed, identified early. And now we have uh, uh, this, uh, reading labs paid by the government for dyslexia kids by the age of eight that it can become diagnosed and also those interventions. Um, so it's three and a half percent of the population, you know, all those figures, so some, some uh, genetic factors. So but this is kind of general. But this is interesting in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of decoding measures that we took. So we had those four measures of word decoding and should have word decoding. And we were interested in, when it comes to identification, how good those measures were in uh, already um, indicating the issue of dyslexia. And uh, what, we, what we saw was that uh, there was an, uh, uh, the, the smaller this area is, the better the sensitivity and specificity of decoding uh, can be seen as. Uh, we saw that decoding accuracy was stronger in uh, word decoding as compared to pseudo word decoding, and it was the other way around in uh, pseudo word uh, decoding uh, when it comes to efficiency. And uh, here we see it's a very small area, that means that with pseudo word uh, decoding efficiency, you can highly predict dyslexia in the Dutch case. So if you have those measures, take those measures into account, and they have an equal prediction, they all highly predict uh, uh, children's uh, dyslexia, much better than vertical, as you can see here. And when you take the precursor measures into account here, then we see that that's not a good prediction. So if we would try to predict children's dyslexia from all those relevant precursor measures, this is really not a good prediction. And interestingly, we did, we, we modeled the prediction of this Dutch dyslexia by first starting with the most important measure, silhouette decoding. That led to uh, R square of 67%. So two thirds of the dyslexics being diagnosed in those reading labs could be diagnosed only by this silhouette decoding measure. Word decoding added up the R square significantly, a little bit, to 71%. And all the fundamental uh, precursor measures didn't add to it to that. So it was fully explained by the two decoding measures. No extra prediction from that fundamental. Across age or for particular yeah, age? Across age. Yeah, across age. Yeah. Okay, then finally uh, intervention. So we developed uh, an adaptive computer program like 10 years ago. And with, uh, uh, with CD-ROMs by the time, and we did all those kind of things, uh, different content measures, so uh, alphabetic principle, automatization of words, uh, the, the consonant plus all those patterns, and polysyllabic words, and uh, we had a, a terrific uh, layout. So we worked with computer people, and so the learning history could be uh, kept track of. So we had source databases involved. And so kids could go in this environment several times during the day. And what we found, so all those kind of uh, 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 tasks were involved. And two things that we found. One was that the accuracy tasks in this environment didn't help those children. So a lot of those tasks we found out later. So we found not terrific effects. So then we went closer to the program and we thought, well, OK. In the, in the case that there was uh, uh, accuracy involved, it was not, not, not a uh, big gain. So that's what we find out in, in, the, in the publication. And, and there was some effect on functional awareness, but the most important one was on uh, word decoding efficiency. And so th that was only uh, um, found for the speed measures in the program. Then we thought, 
Um, it was another project that uh, Elia and I were collaborating on. Uh, we thought, well, maybe it's also possible to help children with uh, a reading efficiency problem to speed up their reading. And so we developed a, a new game in which children uh, start as a submarine and they can compare when they do the task with, uh, that I'll explain you uh, with themselves. So the only competitor is their, their own uh, uh, experience, their own uh, proficiency. And then uh, they can move up uh, to uh, a real boat, to uh, uh, a scooter, to um, uh, a sports wagon, and to uh, um, an airplane, and to a rocket. So several levels by speeding up themselves. And we did this program for, and it was based on, um, they, they were given a word and semantic categories. So finally it's the semantic category that goes with the autographic representation. The children have to do word decoding all the time, and we were interested in the effects, not on the words in the program, but on new words and also on pseudo words. And uh, so we did this for five weeks, intensive training. Uh, children liked it a lot. So, I mean, if you would do this in a regular treatment, children would cry all over. When we stopped the program, children were crying because we stopped the program, so they wanted to go on. And here is the effects, and we took the effects with a control group, and also we could compare the children with themselves. So we could we have uh, their own performance, and by the training we could see the speeding up. So we found in all of those cases for CVC words of different lengths, sorry, uh, meaningful words of different lengths, and for pseudo words, in all those cases we found effects both on um, the comparison with the control group and with the, com the comparison with themselves. And this was not with words that were in the program, but with new words and with shared words. So that was uh, new, and this is now being published in the research yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, final conclusions. <laughs> yeah. Final conclusions. Main research findings when the career is highly based on phonology. Of course, in transparent photography, that's a nice case to study this. Political awareness and RAM predict early weather, weather amplification. Later on, just RAM uh, is uh, still doing it. This way, decoding is highly manual speed. Dyslexics are behind in decoding and phonological precursor measures. There's allophonic speech perception problem evidence and intervention effects, although not nice right. Thank you. These are the Collaborators and besides any other, some others. Okay, we'll take a question or two uh, and then uh, mm -hmm. move okay. on. Or okay, yeah. maybe we'll just have. Uh, oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you see connections between intervention, you know, this is a the word level. So, first of all, so what grade did you give it? And did you, did you see transfer effects to comprehension from this program? No, that's, just a, no. that's a good question. You, you, you didn't tap the comprehension, mm -hmm. but I would say that this will definitely be the case. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that with those gaming uh, uh, stuff that's now going around, I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many new opportunities for right. education, because if you do it in the proper way, so this was, we, we, we developed this game with, with, with a group of uh, young people, startup uh, a company and they are called Clever QL, QL VR. Mm -hmm. So they are highly engaged and they think, oh, problem? okay, we can we can make a nice game for those kids. And they really, really like it. So they had a bombardment of words coming in right. all the time and they wanted to become faster. Mm -hmm. And then you see what's happening. And there's transfer to, not only to, to new words but also to shared words. Mm -hmm. I found it fascinating. I mean, that's the part of the success of the Grapho game, or the mm -hmm. motor, the, the the hype around it is uh, it's getting fast and shooting shoot them down, you know. And now there's this big question. There's this big competition that's going to happen in June. I don't know if you've heard about. It. It's called the X Prize. Mm -hmm. This is this big foundation that they want to give money to solve problems in the world, and one of the big problems now they want to solve is literacy. Mm -hmm. We're going to give $15 million mm -hmm. <laughs> to groups of researchers that will bring tablets. Google is already, somebody has already donated a tablet. 
And part of the question is to, in Africa, they're going to start with Ethiopia. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But part of the problem is that here, for example, there's a sex that they already have the language. Mm -hmm. How are you going to give the tablets, you know, what is it going to be based on? Yeah, at what level can you start these games? At the technological processing, but they have no... Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting, it's a debate now, you know, what to do with this prize. Yeah. Yeah. They build an objective uh, functioning uh, uh, games mm -hmm. to start up uh, the children with those. Uh, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. And they find effects in very rural areas in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes. The same thing. You know. And so I saw some videos on it, and, and it's interesting that you see that, that some of the smartest kids, the later engineers from this rural science, yeah. they, they explain to the other kids how to do it. Mm -hmm. Not all with one child, but one child. Yeah. 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 The visual short-term memory, what came out of that? I'm curious because we have people who are interested in uh, We agree absolutely about phonology. Uh, that's not the whole story. Uh, we had a visual short-term memory there, and you said it, there was something there, but the numbers looked low. Did it contribute? Did yeah, it there was a very small effect in that beginning. At the very beginning? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it might be different in Hebrew, of course. I mean, this is highly specific for orthography. But in transparent orthography, you can imagine that it's not, not so much. We also find in kindergarten and first grade that the visual processing has some kind of contribution, but as you get older, it disappears. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just learning the, the, the just shapes of the letters? Yeah, and from, I think the discrimination between the letters and the diacritics. Yeah. Is very important in Hebrew, and then as the, oh. as it gets less. And just uh, two days ago in, in Jerusalem, I presented uh, research on on uh, orthographic learning, so the pseudo words learning by students in the new orthography. So we have students learning Greek, uh, a group of students mm -hmm. learning uh, Korean, so in two different writing systems also. And then what we saw, so we tapped the fMRI on day one, on day five, and day thirty. And in between, they, they were trained. And what we see in the very beginning of, of, of the installation of those words, that there was a lot of visual attention going on. But that's not leveling off. So it's decreasing all the time. Already at the fifth day, it's so highly decreasing. And then the representation comes up. Angela Gyrus, and all the, the areas in the brain that, that uh, help children to form those uh, autographic representations. And then the visual work is gone, so the visual input of the visual effects are gone. Yeah. It's kind of self -self. Seems some of those findings also work for Chinese. That, that, that early on, mm -hmm. before you get into phonology, you just got to get used to the world of these funny shapes. Okay. And, and they're unique. And, and even in alphabets, you've got uppercase and lowercase, and this form, you've got, al you've got allegraphy, so you've got this A, right, and you've got this A, and you've got three different A's, you know. So there's still there's a bit of learning there. Um, you talked about length effects a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, Eliane, are, are we taking, are there people that need to yes, go? We have three, a lot of us have to Some go of them have to go at three. So what we'll do is, I'll leave these <laughs> questions, and we'll uh, move on. <laughs>